I'd, um, I'd like to get started. So uh, welcome to uh, Applied Machine Learning. Uh, I have to apologize, my voice is a bit gone today, so uh, I would appreciate it if you can um, quiet down. So I'll talk um, today, um, maybe first off, my name is Andreas Muller. Um, I'm a research scientist at the Data Science Institute, and I spend uh, most of my time working on the scikit-learn machine learning library. So um, this class will be um, a course, obviously, about applied machine learning. So it's designed to be taken um, usually in addition to a more theoretical machine learning class, but you can also just take it uh, by itself. If, um, if you do um, take a more theoretical class at the same time, there might be like some slight redundancies, but there's also gonna be uh, a lot of new stuff in this class. So this class is much more hands-on and uh, trying to use existing tools uh, to do machine learning in practice. Um, so yeah, today I'll mostly give like uh, some uh, logistics information about the class and then uh, provide like a high level overview of machine learning and applying machine learning in practice. So first off, um, if you want to email me, this is my, my email address is andreas.muller. It's not a Muller, which is another professor that that now moved, and so he's going to be very angry if you email him. Um, he got so much email last year. Uh, anyway, so um, we have uh, six TAs. Um, I think four of them are here. Can you maybe stand up real quick? Or raise your hand? Okay. So we have three over there at least. Um, so uh, I'm going to announce the office hours. Um, later today, both on the website and on Piazza. Uh, my office hours will be Thursday mornings. We'll make sure that the CIAs have some office hours in the evenings as well, in case you're um, uh, working full time. Though in that case, you might not be here. Um, so right now, the class, I think, is full, and there's a pretty long waiting list. So experience shows that some of the uh, students will drop out, and then we'll fill it up with people on the waiting list. Uh, but, um, so if you're on the waiting list, there are some chances you'll get in, but I assume we're going to get maybe like 10 people in from the waiting list, and I think we have like 80 people on the waiting list right now. Um, we prioritize people that are DSI students and PhD students, and so um, if you're a DSI student that's on the waiting list right now, you have a good chance of getting in, but not 100%. Um, if you don't get on, uh, into the class, uh, but you still want to attend, that's totally fine. So you can audit the class. If this is sort of inofficial audit, which means it will not show up on your transcript. Um, all the materials will be posted online. There will be videos posted online. And um, you can get access to uh, coursework in Piazza. Just email one of the CAs and they'll give you access. But your, if you audit the class, your homework will not be graded and you can't sit in on the exams. So, the, um, you want a second? Okay, so this is the course website. Um, most of the information will be posted on the course website. I sometimes post announcement on um, Coursera as well. For direction with the uh, CAs, obviously you mostly use uh, Piazza. But uh, the course website will have all the slides, have, will have video recordings, and will have the homework and everything else. Um, there will be uh, five assignments. There will be 60% of the total grade. There's going to be 20% of the total grade the first exam, 20% the second exam. All the homework uh, will be programming assignments, and they will be um, submitted through uh, grade scope. And I'm not entirely sure about the first one. I'm probably going to change it up a little bit from last year. But um, at least four of them will be done in Jupyter Notebooks. And you'll submit Jupyter Notebooks as your homework. Um, so as I said, all the slides and course material are on the website. This, um, the slides also come with um, notes. So if you're on the, uh, looking at the slides and you press P, 
or if you, there's like a small dot 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 button on the website, if you click on this, you'll get the slide notes. They're mostly a transcript of what I said uh, two years ago, so it's probably mostly accurate. Um, also, all of the lectures are going to go up on uh, YouTube, so uh, everything will be recorded and uh, be on YouTube and linked to in the course website. Um, that comes with the slight caveat that if you ask a question during class, um, the mic might pick it up and you might be on YouTube. Um, it's very unlikely that, unless you're like in the first row, that uh, it'll actually be audible and you'll be identifiable. But just as a caveat, if you're um, like uncomfortable with being recorded, maybe ask a question after class or um, something like this, because I can't really edit uh, the audio because it would be too much work. Yeah. So yeah, so everything will be recorded and so all the slides will be online um, together with um, me talking. Um, there's also the material online still from uh, last year, um, all the videos and the slides. So this year's course will mostly fo follow what I did last year. So um, if you're not entirely sure whether you want to take the class or not, uh, feel free to check out all the material from last year. It's uh, going to be quite similar. Um, one note about homework. So, um, don't like the homeworks will be automatically checked for plagiarism. If you copy someone else's homework, I will know, and you will get zero points for the homework. Um, so just as a warning, so actually coursework now ha um, has like a code plagiarism thing built in. So if you copy someone's code, we will definitely know. Um, the first assignment and maybe the second assignment will be like individual assignments. Uh, the later assignments will usually be in groups of two. Um, you can copy code from um, my slides or my notebooks. So um, for each lecture, there's also notebooks that are in the GitHub repository that you can check out. If you copy code from anywhere else but the course, um, like from Stack Overflow or from tutorials or from the Second Learn website, that's fine, but you need to um, give the source of where you copied it from. So if you're interested in working with me on research or uh, open source development, uh, I highly encourage you to start um, contributing to Scikit-Learn. So this is what I spend most of my time on. Uh, we have an excellent developer's guide. And so if you want to work with me, a good uh, place to start is pick up some of the easy items. Uh, the issue tracker is full of things that are called like um, good first issue or easy issue. And I encourage you to pick up one of those. And uh, if you finish one or two of those, then come talk to me. Then I can. Uh, uh, take a look at your work, and um, then we can talk about doing some more substantial projects. So, in particular, if you haven't contributed to open source before, it's really good to start with very, very simple things. So, my first contributions were things like um, fixing typos and uh, like doing style changes. In terms of materials for the class, um, in addition to the materials, like the, you can check out stuff from last year, but um, there are several books that I recommend. In the prerequisites, there was a link to the Python Data Science Handbook from Jake Vanderplas. So if you have, uh, or if you're relatively new to doing data science with Python, I definitely recommend you also check out the Python Data Science Handbook. Um, other than that, um, there's uh, my book with Sarah Guido, Introduction to Machine Learning with Python. This, is a bo uh, this book is about basically programming with scikit-learn. This class will go much beyond what's in this book. But um, for the beginning of the class, I think the book will be helpful. I posted a link to the PDF um, in, excuse me, in Courseworks. So you can have access to the PDF there. Uh, please don't share the link uh, because the uh, book is not uh, freely available otherwise. There's two other books that I highly recommend. Uh, one is Applied Predictive Modeling um, by Max Kuhn. Uh, this is more with applications in R, but um, most of the book still applies to using Python. And then finally, there's the Elements of Statistical Learning. This is more of a, 
a theoretical book, so Elements of Statistical Learning has much more on the math and the background, so it's more of a textbook for theory class, but I think it's quite accessible and it's good if you want to uh, uh, know more about the math behind the algorithms and if you're not taking a theory class or as an accompaniment to a theory class. Um, there's another um, uh, book that I recommend, well, actually I forgot the name, but um, you can find it at ciml.info. Um, it's done by um, Hal Dom, who's a, a researcher at Microsoft in New York. All right, so this is um, what I had for uh, logistics. The rest of today, I'm mostly gonna talk about a very high level overview of machine learning and some guiding principles. So basically what is gonna be the goal of this class and what is the goal of applying machine learning in practice? If you're here, you're probably already convinced that machine learning is somewhat useful, but I still wanna give you sort of a light, high level uh, overview. The next couple of classes will be much more like applied uh, coding than this one. So what is machine learning? So machine learning is about extracting knowledge from data and it's very closely related to uh, statistics and optimization. What, in my view, distinguishes machine learning is that it's very focused on um, instance level predictions. So what we want to learn is uh, from a large data set, we want to uh, know how to make decisions for future observations. Um, what you could say is that um, machine learning is an algorithm where the input is a data set and the output is a program that can make predictions. So it's different to traditional sort of programming in that uh, instead of the output being data, the uh, output is a program that can make predictions. I just briefly want to talk through um, a couple of applications. So there's a lot of applications um, in the tech sector, and so I'm going to talk to the, some of those first, but there's also applications in basically all sectors of industry and science. Um, just as a first example, there's, um, here's a screenshot of like a somewhat old version of the um, Facebook timeline. And if you look at any modern web application like this, there's gonna be machine learning in several places. And so there's, um, in reality, there's probably like dozens of machine learning algorithms uh, whose output produced this page. Um, some are very obvious. Uh, for example, it shows an ad in the center that's sort of targeted at pro uh, programmers, and so there's an algorithm that says, uh, how likely am I going to uh, click on an ad and, um, for all the possible ads that they could show me? Then they have an algorithm that actually says, how much should they charge the person that wants to, um, wants to post the ad? Then for the rest of the timeline, there's an algorithm that says, well, in which order should I rank all the different um, posts that I could have on the timeline? What are the, thing, what are the uh, trending topics I should show? What are the friend suggestions I should show? And each of them is a separate uh, algorithm. So you can see that really all the content um, on um, a social media website is mediated by machine learning algorithms. Um, yeah, there's even more if you upload like a picture, uh, it will recognize where faces are. Actually, um, Facebook also knows who's in the picture, it just doesn't show you because uh, otherwise they would get sued in Europe if they show the identities of people. Um, but they very clearly know who's in the picture, but they just allow you to annotate uh, people. Again, it, they understand what is the context of the picture and they show you ads relating to the context. And um, so um, there's really machine learning all over the place. Let me skip ahead a little bit um, and go to a different applications, say uh, Amazon. So if, or if you look at Amazon for machine learning, there's one obvious application of machine learning, which is again, is, uh, retrieving and sorting all the results. 
So figuring out um, uh, what books to show, for example, uh, and the order in which you show them. But then again, there's uh, more algorithms that are maybe not as obvious. There's, for example, a recommendation on the top. It's how, um, or if I click on um, a page, there's like, on a page like this, there's again, there's probably like 10, 20 machine learning algorithms um, that produce this page. Um, one of them says like, what is the default type if someone clicks on this product? Should we try to sell it as a paperback, as a Kindle book, as, a, uh, as an audio book, uh, as a used book? Then um, if the person clicks buy, which seller should I buy this, or should they buy this from? So each book is, or each item at Amazon is associated um, with many different sellers that all try to sell the same product on Amazon. And so there's an algorithm that predicts what is the best se um, seller to buy this from right now as a combination of shipping duration, uh, price, and um, reviews of the, of the seller and so on. And so basically this like buy button also has a machine learning algorithm behind it. Then there's another like frequent item set mining that tells you what, which things this is bought with together. There's another algorithm that tells you what ads to show and so on. And so even though it's not obvious, like there's like machine learning behind basically every decision, even if you don't even see that this decision was made. Um, these companies are on like um, very extreme end of the spectrum in, the, in that they're tech companies that are very established and um, have very mature products. If you go into um, a startup or a company that's not a big tech company, things will usually not look like that. Um, and so in these applications here, in particular if you look at ad click prediction, it's often very important to get like the last percentage uh, point or last 0.00% correct. Um, the most, so these are like quite interesting applications of machine learning, but um, once you get to your job, if it's not at one of the big companies or the big tech companies, or even if it is there, it's much more likely that you end uh, up somewhere where uh, the application is not as mature yet, and um, you will be the first one to deploy machine learning in this setting. So very likely, um, you'll have to start collecting data sets and start um, figuring out how to evaluate something as a machine learning model. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later today. So I think these are some interesting applications of machine learning to showcase because um, you probably all interacted with at least one of them today. But um, they're actually quite atypical in when it comes to like machine learning data science jobs. Um, yeah, so maybe as a small anecdote, I used to work at Amazon for like a year and um, if you work on the applications that I just talked about, the data sets are basically ready and there's already a machine learning uh, mechanism in place. What I worked on was image quality and so to collect the data set, I had to SSH into the machine of someone that has image annotation in India and I need to SCP the data over. Um, to get the data, and then I needed to define the metric, and then I need to relabel the ground truth, and so on. So even though I was at like a big tech company, um, there was no infrastructure to do this at all. And so basically, it's very different from you, uh, doing an initial prototype for something um, compared to uh, working on a very mature product. Um, Another interesting set of applications um, is in science. So I d there's uh, applications in science um, basically everywhere where there's data. Um, this picture here shows an application of someone that I knew that worked at NYU uh, until recently who worked on exoplanets. Exoplanets are planets that circle uh, suns around um, um, distant stars, so stars that are not the sun. And uh, this is a great artist's depiction of what's happening. Um, though, if you look at the sensor, what the sensor sees is the star is a single pixel. So you have like a single spot. And that periodically, it's a little bit blurry, and periodically gets uh, darker and lighter. And so the way they find exoplanets mostly is uh, by the transit method that's illustrated here, which is they look at 
this, this sort of one single blurry pixel getting slightly darker and slightly brighter. And if they find uh, a periodic pattern in that, then they can um, figure out if this per periodic pattern could correspond to occlusion by a planet that transits in front of the sun. And then they can figure out um, basically is the, um, is the decrease in brightness um, corresponds to the right mass for the period of the orbit that they see and so on. But basically you have like a series of a pixel getting slightly darker and brighter and if it has the right pattern then you uh, conclude there is a planet. And this, for, this is one application where you have mass amounts of data sets because you have so many stars, you have really long time series and machine learning can really help you to identify these patterns. But obviously there's like applications in like engineering, like in computer science, like intrusion detection, cybersecurity, fault detection in um, construction. Um, there's lots of applications in biomedical science and medicine, in uh, geophysics, um, basically wherever you have data, there's um, machine learning applications. So I want to move on to um, the different kinds of um, machine learning um, that there are and the ones that we will be working with. So there's, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so there's three main types of machine learning. Um, anyone know what those are? Supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement. Yes. So. I just want to briefly go over the basic principles of all three of them. In this class, we will focus mostly about supervised learning because supervised learning is by far the most successful in practice these days. Sorry, my voice is like nearly gone. Um, we'll also do some unsupervised learning and we'll not do reinforcement learning at all in this class. So, um, the idea behind supervised learning is that um, you collected samples um, that were drawn from some distribution that we call P, uh, that I call P of x and y, where x is some features or dependent variable describing some data point, say um, a patient in a medical setting, whereas um, y i is a target that you're interested in predicting, um, say. Uh, their diagnosis. We assume these are drawn IID, which means um, independent identity distributed. This means all of the samples that we drew, uh, which we drew from this distribution um, were independent and they're also uh, drawn from the same distribution. This is basically a core assumption in theoretical machine learning and something that we basically assume all the time. It's uh, basically never true. Um, but the w uh, way you can think about this is that you can um, imagine them being, uh, all the samples being interchangeable. Um, an example where this is not true is, say, if you have a time series, uh, because there would be an order to the samples and they would be correlated according to their timestamp, and so they would not be IID. Or, um, if I uh, draw samples from uh, some different distributions, so let's say I have pa patients uh, from some hospital in New York and I have patients for some ho from some hospital in San Francisco, and if I put them in the same data set and um, I don't record which hospital they come from, they would not be IID because there's an underlying correlation structure in the data. The patients from San Francisco will be more similar at uh, amongst each other and the patients from New York will be more similar uh, among each other. And so um, for most of the class we will assume that uh, this IID setting is true so all the samples are sort of created the same but you should uh, whenever you face any application you should ask yourself is this assumption true and in which way is it violated and how can I compensate for the fact that it's violated. All right, so assume you're given a um, data set like this. The goal is to find a function 
um, or program F that um, given the description of the data that features XI, it can approximately reconstruct YI. This would basically be a function interpolation trying to figure out a uh, given uh, sample from distribution, a function that reproduces the samples. Um, given that the, st um, the samples come from a distribution, doesn't, doesn't necessarily need to be possible. So um, a single xi could be associated with multiple possible values of yi in this distribution, and then such a function doesn't exist. Um, and that's commonly true if there, if there is noisy measurements. But we want to find a good approximation. But the really interesting part about machine learning is, or supervised learning, is that we want to try to find a function that not only approximates, um, that sort of f of x i is not only approximate to y i for the samples that we collected, but also for any new data that is drawn i i d from the same distribution. So if I draw a new pair, x, y from the distribution p of x and y, I want to be f of x also be close to y. And that's called generalization. Again, there's an important assumption here, which is that um, the new data we want to apply our model to comes from the same distribution. So in other words, um, your test set comes from the same distribution as your training set. Um, some common examples of supervised learning are spam detection. That was one of the first like commercial applications uh, where um, you might, uh, might not remember um, annotating email as spam. If you get a spam email, there's a button annotating it as spam. And um, so then I guess these days uh, Google would uh, collect uh, or whatever email providers would collect all um, the information of email that were annotated as spam uh, would build a machine learning model based on features of the emails, say word frequency in the email, the sender, uh, the length, um, maybe the IP addresses, uh, the way it was routed, header information, and so on, whether uh, a given email was spam or not. It would build this model on the data that was, humanly, uh, was annotated by humans and then uh, this would be sh uh, shipped into the product, and then for new incoming email, uh, there would be a prediction made whether the email is um, expected to be spam or not, and then action would be taken accordingly. Um, other examples would um, be maybe that uh, medical diagnosis where you have patient records and you want to make a preliminary diagnosis um, you probably don't want a machine learning algorithm to do an ultimate diagnosis, but you might want to um, do sc uh, screening for medical diagnosis. So you would rec uh, have uh, medical records together with an outcome that's either uh, created by um, expert humans or by a doctor, or that's the result from additional tests. Say you can get the result by doing some very expensive or very painful tests, and you want to um, see if you need to run this expensive or painful test, and you could try to um, break the outcome of this test, maybe using uh, other data you have about the patient. Um, and I already mentioned ad click predictions, so here the uh, problem would be predicting whether a user on a website clicks on an ad or not, and depending on this, basically uh, show a particular ad if the likelihood is high or place it in a place where the likelihood would be high for the user to click on. And I'll talk about um, some differences in uh, how you set these uh, problems up in a little bit. <coughs> oh, great. Um, so the second type is unsupervised learning. So in unsupervised learning, you're basically just given samples from a distribution and the goal is to learn about the distribution. So usually, again, we assume that the data is drawn IID. And um, this is sort of a very vague task, uh, and there's uh, several flavors of it. So one would be to actually find a model for P, so to find um, something that describes probability density, so you can uh, evaluate for a new sample whether it's likely to come from a distribution or not. This could be used in, say, outlier detection. 
um, or you could find a way to, um, or you maybe want to have a way to sample from this distribution. This is what, in a sense, what GANs are doing, like given a large collection of images, how can I generate a similar image? Um, more tra uh, traditional kinds of unsupervised learning are clustering, where you're trying to find subgroups in the data that look similar or behave similarly, or do um, dimensionality reduction, uh, where you're trying to um, either compress the data set to a more low-dimensional representation, or maybe project it down to two dimensions for visualization. So there's two areas where unsupervised learning is quite commonly used. Um, one is as a pre-processing technique for supervised learning, um, so to extract features for supervised learning problems. Um, the other is an exploratory data analysis. So clustering dimensionality reaction are very often used to get some initial idea of the data, but they're not then used in a production system. One of the reasons is that it's very hard to evaluate a lot of unsupervised learning algorithms. This is true for sort of classical clustering. This is also still true for GANs. Um, so if you have a clustering of your data set, it's basically impossible to say um, objectively, is this a good way to cluster the data or not? And so in most applications, um, particularly in like production environments, supervised learning is much, much more commonly used. And so, yeah, most of the class will um, focus on supervised learning. Um, finally, there's reinforcement learning. So that, that used to be popular like in the 90s, like neural networks, and has been become more popular in the last couple of years. Um, I think the reason why it's become more popular recently is because there were some breakthroughs in uh, playing games. In particular, there was um, AlphaGo beating the world champion in Go, which was um, quite interesting because most people thought um, machines be having superhuman skills in Go would be like a decade or two get decades out. So it was quite surprising for people. Um, basically, they used uh, deep neural networks and deep reinforcement learning uh, to learn an algorithm that can play uh, the board game Go at superhuman level. So it was very surprising because the state space of Go is very big. Um, people used it to play Atari. Now uh, DeepMind is working on uh, playing StarCraft and they're basically at like um, high expert level or like they're about as good as the best people in the world in StarCraft, I think, last time I checked. Um, people are also interested in reinforcement learning for um, self-driving cars and uh, for robotics. Um, and so what is the, the principle be behind reinforcement learning? It's quite different from supervised and unsupervised learning and that it doesn't work on a fixed data set. Instead, it works with an agent that interacts with an environment. So the agent would be the program playing the game or maybe the, dr the car driving around or um, the robot trying to walk around. And so you don't collect the data set, but you have the agent take ac action and every time the agent uh, takes an action, the ch uh, state of the environment uh, changes. And so if you imagine this uh, a board game, the uh, player might basically like place a stone and go. And um, so then the opponent reacts by also placing a stone. And so the state of the board changes by the, um, well, in two ways. So first you place a stone that changes the state and then the opponent uh, places a stone. And then so you get a new state back from the world, which is the new board, which has both of these stones pl uh, placed. And um, the learning signal that the agent gets is a reward it gets at every step, or potentially at every step, that tells it whether the action was good or not. A big um, issue in reinforcement learning is that this, this um, reward might be very delayed. So, for example, for game, by playing Go, you might have a reward only at the end of the game. So once you won the game, you get, a, say, a high reward because you won the game. And... Um, if uh, you lose, you get like a very negative reward because you lost the game. But then the, uh, this is the only uh, training signal. And so the um, agent needs to interact with the world um, 
many times, they may play many different games to figure out what are the things that actually gave it the rewards and what actually corresponded to good outcomes. And so this is a very generic framework because you only basically need to be able to give a reward in the end or whenever something good happens. You, it's not supervised in that you never give the right sequence of action to the agent. And so it's, you know, in a sense, it's great to learn very complex behavior like playing uh, Go, which is like really Im impressive. However, um, the agent usually needs to interact with the world a lot. So these Go uh, playing agents, they played um, millions of games. And um, so this only works as long as you have either a very, very good model of the environment or um, the environment is virtual entirely. So we can just have the Go agent play itself over and over on the board, or we can have the uh, agents play StarCraft against each other all, uh, for a long time. But even if you want to have a robot learn to walk, this is very tricky. If you try to do this in the real world, if you have a robot try to walk, walk um, and it will fall down a million times before it uh, can walk, there's two problems with this. A, you have to have a very, very patient grad student put him under his feet every time. And B, it will just break out and the sensors will wear out and the motors will wear out and the behavior will change before it even started learning. For some settings, you can create a, uh, a simulation and for some robotics applications, you can learn a simulation. But if you look at things like self-driving cars, the real world and driving around in a city is way too complex to um, really simulate. There's weather patterns, there's reflections in store windows, there's people being really weird, and they have weird things they're driving around on. And so there's no way you can simulate this. And so you cannot, re there might be aspects of self-driving cars you can automate with reinforcement learning, but you can clearly not learn the whole thing because you can't have a car, like very expensive self-driving cars crash a million times before they get the route correctly. Um, and so this is one, one of the reasons why reinforcement learning is sort of, it's very popular in research because it can um, learn really amazing uh, complex skills, but only as long as you can basically simulate the setting perfectly. Um, there's another setting that is maybe a little bit more interesting uh, for applications, uh, which is thinking of uh, social media, or web interactions in general, as an agent interacting with an environment. So here the agent would be the Facebook timeline, and um, the environment would be all of you looking at it. And um, basically the agent would be rewarded whenever you interact, or whenever you keep scrolling. Um, Right now, this is usually modeled as a supervised learning problem, but in a sense, um, the, these interactions are conditioned on each other, right? So not every time the, an ad is shown to you or some contact is shown to you, it's a new interaction. There's actually, you have a mental state uh, of like how you interact with social media or how you interact with the web or a different application. And so uh, the repeated interaction with the app will change how you react. So, um, you could think of this as a game where basically the Facebook timeline is trying to play a game against you where it's trying to keep you attracted for as long as possible. Um, and so this is something people are interested in. I mean, I'm not gonna say whether that's a good thing to do or not. Um, or maybe I'll talk a little bit about that later, but um, this is a setting where reinforcement learning might be interesting for commercial applications, but uh, I don't think it's currently used in that way. So reinforcement learning could be um, applied to user interactions, and um, we have so much data about that, uh, about that that it might be possible there. But anyway, so right now reinforcement learning is mostly limited to having simulation uh, settings. And yeah, we're not gonna talk about this at all in this lecture following now. Um, so, there's other kinds of learning. Um, 
very clear. Like there's semi-supervised learning where some of the samples are labeled and others are not labeled. There's active learning where you can, where the algorithm can ask for certain things to be labeled if they're uncertain. There's uh, forecasting, which deals with time series, which are correlated. And um, uh, we are going to talk a little bit about some of these, but I think if you understand the main principles behind supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning, these are sort of the main building blocks that um, um, make up all the other kinds of learning. <coughs> There's been sort of a, been an interesting back and forth uh, between um, the importance of supervised and unsupervised learning. So, um, Jan McCann, uh, who's uh, at Facebook, and you might know him, he actually made this statement, and so you could buy this t-shirt, probably I think already like 10 years ago, says the revolution will not be supervised. Um, the idea behind this statement is that for many problems, we don't actually have labeled data. We don't know what the correct outcome is. And so we can't use supervised learning. Uh, if you compare it with humans, machine learning algorithms, uh, also the supervised algorithms, need to have like thousands or hundreds of thousands of samples to learn a concept, where a human can usually learn a concept with like five demonstrations. And um, so people have argued for a long time that um, actually we need to learn better, we need to do unsupervised learning better to learn more about the world, to find better representations. And so Jan has been working on this since the 1990s. And so it's interesting because in the early 2000s, they were all working on doing unsupervised feature extraction for images. And it was like working so-so. And then ImageNet came along and people found out, well, we have to supervise algorithms. So ImageNet is labeled for classification. But if we try to supervise algorithm on ImageNet, we could actually use these representations um, on uh, many different tasks. So it was actually not unsupervised learning, but it was supervised learning that helped people to find these representations that were useful for new tasks. Uh, now, I think like two years ago, um, the tables turned again because um, uh, in text processing, there were uh, the transformer architecture and the Elmo and Bird architectures. These architectures are what people now call self-supervised, what, what, which is basically unsupervised. And their um, unsupervised learning is used to create really powerful representations that are later used in supervised learning. So now um, people are, are again a little bit more on board with the revolution will not be supervised because in text processing now unsupervised learning has been shown to be um, really, really powerful. And in the end, like towards the end of the semester, we'll talk a little bit at least about uh, these new architectures. But again, the final goal is not unsupervised learning. The final goal in these applications is usually supervised learning. So you want to do a classification task on text, say. All right. So let's dive a little bit more deeply into um, supervised learning, which is what we all spend most of our time on. And let's hope my uh, voice will keep on going for another half hour. So as you probably know, there's, <clears throat> oh my God, there's two main types of um, supervised learning, classification and regression. And um, where the main difference, is, or the one difference is that in classification, Y is um, discrete, so very often it's a binary task where it's a yes-no question, say, is this patient sick? It could also be a multi-class problem where you have a discrete choice um, between a list of things, say, what is the most likely disease for this patient? Whereas in regression, your uh, target is continuous. Um, say, how long will it take for a patient to recover? Or what is the blood sugar level of this patient? And so um, these two classes uh, require different kinds of algorithms and require different kinds of uh, metrics to measure success. In classification, what we really want is we want to have the 
exact outcome. We want to, if the answer is yes, we don't want to get no, we want to get yes. Whereas in regression, if, uh, say, you expect it'll take the patient uh, 32 days to recover and it'll take them 33 days, they might still be fine. So as there's a continuum in the output, um, having an approximate answer is often still useful. If you encounter a machine learning problem in the real world, um, very often it's clear whether it's a, re a regression or classification problem, though it's not always entirely clear. Um, one example is a five-star rating system, which you have in a lot of like um, web apps, where there's user interaction. Users rate um, like restaurants or drivers or whatever they want with a five-star system. Let's say you want to predict for a movie um, how many stars the user will give it. It could be cast either as a five-class classification problem or it could be cast as a regression problem, particularly an ordinal regression problem. And um, whether you cast it one way or the other way will depend on um, how you want to measure mistakes and uh, what kind of algorithms you want to use. And uh, if, you measure, if you model it as a five-class classification problem, then the model doesn't know, any, doesn't know that the two stars so is between one and three stars. Whereas if you uh, model it as an ordinal regression problem, this information would be given to the model. <clears throat> One thing I want to emphasize during this course is that um, if you um, look at machine learning competitions like Kaggle or very often like things that you see during your studies, the framing of the question is given to you. Whereas if you're a data scientist as a company, the framing of the question is basically never given to you. And so some, some, uh, a simple question like whether something should be phrased as classification or regression is an open question that actually you have to find an answer to. And you should uh, get, get used to that. And hopefully you have the, um, uh, the ability to get used to that during the course. Um, because, before I talk more about like some general principles of machine learning, I want to um, very briefly make a side note in contrasting this class with like things you would do in a standard statistics class. I don't think really it makes sense to contrast machine learning and statistics. They are very, very overlapping fields, but they have usually, traditionally at least, have so a different emphasis. And I think it makes sense to think about this different emphasis in, in these disciplines. Um, even though two of the books I showed at the beginning for this class were statistics textbooks. And so these disciplines really have more, more in common than, have in, in, than they're different. But statistics traditionally has an inference emphasis. What, does mean, what I mean by this is you're usually given the population and um, say the students in this class and you want to answer a question about the population. And, um, or not only about the population, um, sorry, what I should have said is you're given a sample from a population. So um, there is a population out there that you're interested in, you're given a sample of the population, and you want to make a statement about this population. Say, um, are men more likely to enroll in a data science program than women? This is sort of a single yes, no question that you want to answer and you want to say, how, how certain are you about the answer for the whole population? Or say, in a medical setting, you want to say, well, how likely is it that this gene causes this disease? And you're given um, some patients, they, patients represent a sample of all possible patients, um, and you want to make a statement about, does this gene interact um, with this uh, disease? Whereas, in uh, machine learning, you're more interested, or usually interested, in prediction. In prediction, you want to make individual level inferences. So, let's say we want to build a model, given a particular person, do we think this person is likely to enroll in data science? Or, um, given a, a patient, do we think, given the data about the genetics of this patient, do we think 
they will get this disease or not. And um, the tools for these two tasks are quite different. And so in this course, we will only talk about prediction problems, basically. And for a prediction problem, we say a model is good if it does well at predicting on new data. We make the IID assumption saying we assume all the data is generated from the same process. And if we can generalize to data generated by the same process, we say the model is good. We don't really care about whether the model is um, an accurate model of what happens in the real world. Um, if you look at like deep neural networks for image recognition, they're clearly not like a model for the concept, but they are still good at making um, uh, good predictions. Um, another difference is that instead machine learning, as I said, we usually make this ID assumption, so we assume that everything uh, that we have samples from the same distribution. Whereas in statistics, very often you build models to adjust for um, the sampling of your distribution. If you look at um, statistics, make the forecasts for the next presidential election, the, the amount of IID data they have for the next presidential election, or let's say the next primaries, is zero. They have zero samples for the votes for the next primaries because they haven't yet happened yet. They have data about past votes, and um, they can come up with probabilistic models that can tell how can we infer from past um, votes what will happen in the next uh, primary or in the next election. <coughs> but, um, so th but there you have make assumptions about the distribution, and uh, you build a model based on the assumptions about the distribution. In this class, we will not make any assumption about the distribution, and we basically will always assume the data is IID, and we're actually sampled data from the same distribution that we're gonna test on. We're gonna be maybe a little bit careful about um, whether this assumption holds, and think about whether this assumption holds, but generally we will make the assumption, this assumption. And so as long as um, a model uh, makes good prediction, we think the model is good. And so um, this basically means this class will not have any p-values because they are not really relevant. They will not have any AIC or BIC or model fit because we're not interested in whether the model fits the data. We're interested in, does the model make good predictions? And I'm not saying sort of one is better than the other. I'm just saying you need to think about what is the kind of question that you want to ask. Do you, are you, care, do you care about inference or do you care about prediction? And given that this is the thing you care about, what are the right tools for the job? There's actually a very interesting paper that thinks deeply about the connection between inference and prediction, and uh, which is called um, uh, Two Cultures by Leo Breiman. And um, whether you're a statistics person or, or a mouth person, it's a classical paper that you should definitely check out. Um, so Leo Breiman is the guy that invented random forests. He was a statistician, and he says statisticians should think more about prediction, and statisticians were really angry at him about it. Um, anyway, so for the remaining, I guess, uh, 20 minutes, I want to give like, or for as long as my voice lasts, I want to give some uh, guiding principles in machine learning and how I think you should think about machine learning or how I think about machine learning in uh, particular applications. Um, hopefully we'll, we'll revisit them later in the semester and they will also be like sort of a threat through the rest of the class. I think the most important thing um, in any data analysis or data science application is thinking about the goal. Before you do anything, you should think about what is the goal of this application? What is the goal of the analysis? And um, so in this way, I think doing competitions, say on Kaggle, is like a really bad way to 
learn about doing data science and machine learning because Gaggle usually gives you a goal. It tells you optimize the log loss on the test set. And as I said, in the real world, this is never your goal. In science, you might want to make a discovery. In medicine, you might want to make sure that like, you, ca you um, treat patients that need to be treated. Uh, in business, you usually your goal is to make money, but usually it's, you can't really uh, relate what you're doing directly to making money, so maybe you want to maximize customer engagement. If you can, whatever you're trying to do, relate it directly to the bottom line, that would be ideal, but um, it's usually hard. The goal is never get a high accuracy in this classification problem. Whether you're in a medical setting or whether you're doing ad clicks, your goal is never ever maximize accuracy. Um, so you should really think hard about what is your goal. In this context, you should think about also, is it worth building a very complex system to achieve this goal? Once you have your goal, I think what you should do is collect data that allows you to measure um, what any solution would do to this goal. So if you want to like, uh, increase user engagement, you should measure user engagement first. Um, so I was at Amazon, I was supposed to do like image quality, but I had, no one had collected any data. So they told me, well, improve this process, but I didn't even know whether the process they had right now was working or not. Very often there will be a, like a manual or an ad hoc process in place that you're trying to replace with machine learning. Um, but the first thing you need to do is collect data about how well does this process work and how does it impact whatever I'm interested in. In particular, a very important question then is, does it make sense to use machine learning? Does it make sense to use like a complex technical solution to this problem? Is it worth spending your time solving this problem at all? As a data scientist, a very important question is, what is the problem that most deserves your attention and that most deserves your time? Um, I think a very common topic is that providing an initial solution to some problem can have a great benefit for a business, but then squeezing out the last decimal and the accuracy will not have a big impact and would be much more um, uh, beneficial for your company to go to the next application. For many data scientists, coming up with really fancy algorithm is the fun part, and so if they can play around with deep learning for a month, they're very happy, but very commonly this is not really what is needed and that's not really useful. Um, if you say, well, I can do this and still keep my job and I don't care if it helps the company, that's fine, but you should do this as a conscious decision. Um, very commonly, um, like complex solutions are not worth the cost. In particular, if you're building production systems, uh, machine learning systems are very complex. They depend on the training data used. They depend on all the hyperparameters. It's very hard to predict what they will do in any given situation. Um, they will see input that doesn't reflect the data that you trained it on. And so it's an important question to see what are the risks and benefits of using machine learning in any, um, in any applications. <clears throat> um, you should always first establish a baseline. Say if I write down the silliest if that I can come up with to make a decision, um, what will the outcome of using the silly if be? Maybe the if is just, or, or maybe there's not even an if, and you say, always predict the patient is, has a disease and always send them to the doctor. What would be the outcome of this? Um, and then you can start measuring the benefit of adopting more complex solutions beyond just doing something very simple or very stupid. Um, you should also make sure to think about how to measure uh, the outcome of your solution in the context of your application. If you have a system that interacts with users, doing an offline evaluation will be very different from doing an online evaluation. So if you have um, a data set collected, 
of like how users behaved, and then you have like, well, um, and then you try to model based on this what an algorithm will do. It will not really give you an accurate picture. In the real world, your users will change behavior based on your algorithm. So if you, if you have anything in your website that it adopts to user behavior, the users in the end will adopt to the different behavior. And so while you're building and prototyping machine learning models, it's often very hard to measure this. But um, you should at least have a plan on how can I measure the feedback loop of adopting a particular system. Um, one of the things you could do is do things like um, A-B testing or, um, yeah, or like doing uh, trial, other kinds of trial runs on subsets of the population or for short periods of time. But you should have a plan on how to evaluate whatever system you're coming up with in the concept, context of um, replication. Usually, while you're doing your initial data analysis um, and your first um, models, you will not really do that. You will not go to like do an A-B test every time you build a new model. You will uh, usually have some offline metric. And so a first attempt at an offline metric could be something like accuracy or mean squared error. Um, but you should think about how good is that a substitute? And what are the consequences of uh, using the substitute? One thing that you should, um, like, or one example that you might be aware of that's discussed quite a bit recently is um, the substitute that, say, YouTube uses. So YouTube uses, um, so what YouTube wants to do is like, they want to make money. How do they make money? By showing you ads. So the thing that they actually want to um, optimize is time that people view ads or click on ads. Um, what they actually optimize then is, um, uh, oh, I don't know. They probably optimize something very complicated that I don't know. But um, they um, want to think they optimize is view time and click through time. And, they, and so what happened is that algorithms figured out, well, the more um, outrageous the content, the more engaged the person is. And so there's these um, sort of uh, YouTube black holes where uh, content gets more and more extreme if you uh, keep watching and people will be shown like weird conspiracy theories because it keeps them watching. Um, in this context, the substitute might actually do what they want to do, so it might actually increase how much ads people watch, but it has like um, unintended side uh, consequences, like um, making uh, surfacing more and more extreme context uh, content. <clears throat> Other times, um, the a substitute you can use could just be very bad. So for example, um, if you're doing advertising, a common ad, um, substitute was click-through rate. Like how much do people click on the ad? One way to optimize people clicking on the ad is put it right next to an important button, the search button. Like if you put an ad right near, next to the Google search button or right next to the Amazon search button, People will click on it all the time, and they get really angry for clicking on it. So even as though your metric says, oh, if you put the button there, um, the click-through rate will be really high, uh, the people will not actually buy something, and they might even buy less because they got angry at your website. Um, so whenever you build a substitute for the thing that, so you probably have to build a substitute um, for the thing you care about, because you can't always test everything in a live production system. But when you build a substitute, be aware that you build a substitute and think about the consequences of the substitute that you're building. <clears throat> um, finally, um, another thing that uh, we'll talk about a little bit in a later section, but I think that's commonly overlooked, 
is um, communicating results. There's several ways where com uh, several parts in a machine learning workflow where communicating results is quite important. Um, one of them is communicating results to the people that get the prediction. So if you look at Amazon recommendations, it'll tell you, I recommended you this book because you like this other book. And user studies have shown time and again that if you tell a user why you recommend something to them, it's, um, the user is more likely to accept that. If um, someone sh like shows you your credit card score and you also give them reason of why this is your credit card score, people are probably more likely to accept that as well. So if you give um, users an explanation of why did you make a prediction, um, they might be much more willing to engage with your process. Similarly, like if you post a picture on Instagram and it's flagged as being inappropriate, Maybe if the algorithm tells you why it thinks it's inappropriate, you'll be less angry at Instagram. Um, also, it turns out that it doesn't matter really if their explanation is a real explanation or if it's um, a made-up explanation as long as it's plausible. So there's ethical questions in giving users fake explanations, but it doesn't actually matter for the user behavior, whether the explanation it shows here are real. So at least last time I checked, they were real because Amazon wanted to be honest. But you could also have a, a, one algorithm that makes recommendation and another algorithm that provides something that looks like an explanation. And users will be more, much more happy if you do that. Um, if you're cheating your users, or if you think you're cheating your users, that, if you do that, then uh, that's up to you. Uh, if you want to do that or not. Though I would argue humans do the same. I think there are studies about that. Like, If you ask someone for why they did something, they will make up the reason just when they answer you. The reason they will give you is not actually the reason why they did something, but they, they, pe people do something and then later on they like rationalize what they did. And so maybe it's okay to have your machine learning algorithms do that as well. <laughs> I don't know. Um, That brings me to, <clears throat> excuse me, um, one of the last points I guess we can talk about today, which is um, ethical considerations. In um, machine, if you, whenever any application interfaces with humans in any way, you should think about what are the uh, consequences to the users or to the humans interfaces with. There's a giant amount of ethical issues um, in uh, tech, and uh, many of them um, re uh, relate to machine learning applications. In particular, um, issues uh, of bi uh, bias and prejudice. Um, if your data set is biased, a machine learning algorithm will learn the bias in the data and will probably increase it. Um, so saying, well, algorithms are unbiased because they're like just algorithms is like a terrible, terrible thing to say and completely false. Um, this started to get a lot of attention um, after, or even more attention after an article on ProPublica. If you haven't seen this, so this is now sort of classical in this, in this area. It's about a compass system which is a commercial system that was used in the U.S. criminal justice system to assert whether um, um, someone that was arrested is um, at a high or low risk uh, to reoffend, and based on this score, a uh, judge decided on whether they can post bail or whether they need to stay in prison. Um, and so in this uh, article, ProPublica argues that, given this example here, which I, um, where you have these two people on the left, um, Vernon Prater, who had, um, as prior offenses, two armed robbery and one attempted armed robbery and uh, one grand theft. And on the right-hand side, you have uh, uh, Brisha Bor uh, Borden, 
who had four juvenile misdemeanors, and the person left by the system is um, um, considered low risk at, at uh, re-offending, the person on the right is considered high risk. Whereas, um, given these offenses, you would usually think the person on the left is um, at higher risk of um, um, committing another crime. So the analysis, according to uh, ProPublica, is that the system was biased against people of color, and so the person on the right, I'm not sure if you can see the picture, is a person of color, and um, was therefore assigned a higher risk score. Um, there's been a lot of work about <clears throat> fairness, and there's actually not really an easy answer, but it is an issue that you should definitely pay attention to. Um, and um, there's actually, there's a conference called um, Fat Star. There's a conference all about just fairness and transparency in machine learning and data science. And um, you should um, check this out. I mean, also, I should probably post on um, coursework, a great talk that um, uh, Zach Lipton gave at NeurIPS um, a couple of months ago about um, issues in fairness and dealing algorithmically with fa fairness. This problem, so this system had many problems. One of them is it also didn't give any explanations. This actually is um, a, commercial, uh, a commercial application compass. So basically it's a program the judges get a program, the program makes predictions. There's nothing given about the training data set. There's no information about what model is used, uh, nothing. And so this is not really, maybe this is not something that people should use to make, um, assist, uh, make decisions in a criminal justice system just using some product that someone sold you. Um, there's um, uh, many more um, um, examples of this. I think like a year ago, Amazon tried to um, automate part of the hiring process, but they uh, very quickly stopped doing it because it was um, highly biased towards uh, male applicants. Because um, was again, um, so while traditionally there's was a strong bias to hire male applicants, so the data set it was trained on was highly biased and. Um, so the machine learning algorithm learned to replicate the bias. And um, yeah, so basically it was like a terribly unfair system. Um, so there, yeah, there are some issues with the algorithmic fixes to fairness, but I think it's definitely something you should be aware of. Even if it's uh, not obvious, there are other examples. Um, I think it might have been Amazon or it might have been like Staples or something, which um, gave promotions to people. Um, I think, and I can't have, I think it can't have been Amazon because they don't do that, but it doesn't matter. So it was like a um, company that ships stuff to people and they gave um, special discounts to people in certain areas and uh, they used zip code features for this. And um, turns out in the US, Basically, everything you can measure about a person is a proxy for race. And so basically, then um, what they did is they um, found that people in certain neighborhoods bought more, and so they give them more uh, discounts. Turns out that basically people um, that are in uh, very gentrified neighborhoods were getting all the discounts, and people that were in poorer, uh, poorer neighborhoods um, uh, we basically had to pay more. And it was not something that was sort of obvious from the application or from the data or anything like this. Um, it was basically just, just zip codes or just geographical location, but this is usually very highly correlated with like in, things like income and race and social background. Um, yeah, there's a lot of issues um, that are related to how is the data used and so should at least think about, could there be ethical issues and how can I measure whether there's ethical issues? Um, oh, there's actually, oh, I had more stuff, but I think we're gonna wrap up. Maybe um, a very last point I want to make is thinking about free versus expensive data. Of course, that's something that we will, <coughs> excuse me, 
definitely come up again in, in your um, applications. Um, I gave just different applications of supervised learning earlier. And very often, in particular, if you want to um, predict the future, you're given the supervised classification, ta uh, the targets for free. If you want to automate a complex process, usually you have to pay a, a lot of money to label the data. So if you want to label like radiology images, you have to pay a radiologist. Um, if you want to figure, predict clicks, you just have wait and see for people to click or not. Uh, the example of house numbers, which is now um, pedestrian crossings, is if you're Google, you can also use CAPTCHA to have people label data for you for free. So uh, sometimes it's interesting to look at what are ways that I can get a lot of label data um, cheaply. Um, it's a little bit trickier if you're not Google, but um, it's uh, interesting to think about what things uh, can I get supervised information for and which things do I have to pay a lot of information, uh, pay a lot of money to get this information. All right, so I want to wrap up for today. Um, I'll stick around for, if you have any questions, and I'll see you Monday.